Welcome back to the podcast. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Dwayne Bratt, who is a professor of political science at Mont Royal University in Calgary. We have our second Albertan on in, I think, as many weeks. Uh, Dr. Bratt, it's uh, wonderful to have you here on Decouple. Thanks for making the time. Oh, happy to be here, Chris. It's okay if I call you Dwayne or? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, That's why my right. mama calls me. <laughs> okay. Well, Dwayne, um, you're the author of, uh, of two books. Uh, you kindly sent me um, this one here. The Politics of Can-Do Exports, uh, but also uh, this one here, uh, Can-Do, sorry, Canada, the Provinces, the Global Nuclear Revival. Awesome books. The only problem I have is uh, the binding is just terrible. Uh, you know, chunks. Yes, the binding hand. with McGill Queens University Press. Yes, it's it's not very good. Um, but the uh, the U of T Press one is is much better. So, uh, you know, the binding, not so good. The content, excellent. And, you know, I really uh, regret it not having uh, picked these books up earlier. Um, I gave a talk uh, to the Minerals Council of Australia um, on the topic of, you know, how Ontario decarbonized. And, you know, I, I had a bunch of facts from from conversations with some very well-informed people, but uh, great resource. Um, you know, a fascinating time capsule as well. Um, so you published uh, Canada, the Provinces and the Global Nuclear Revival in 2012. Um, you know, on our last episode, I was reflecting with uh, James Krallenstein. We we're talking about this current moment, moment um, and everyone seems hesitant to call it a renaissance uh, because I think people were really burned by that language uh, back in the early 2000s. And we were reflecting actually on how good things would have seemed around 2005, 2006, uh, even compared to now. I mean, I would say 2018 was a real low point. Um, we had, you know, a lot of projects that were just not moving well. The EPRs in France, the AP1000s in the U.S. Um, we have this glut in natural gas prices, um, and uh, we had the Fukushima hangover. And so things feel great right now. But um, you know, again, back in the uh, the noughties, as we call them in uh, in the U.K. sphere of influence, uh, the early 2000s, things looked pretty good. Um, you wrote this, I guess, probably over a few years. Um, let's let's time yep. travel back. Let's time travel back to uh, when you wrote it, why you wrote it, and uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll explore some of the lessons therein. Yeah, in 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 a sense, you can't understand the second book without the the first book, and the and the first book actually started as a master's thesis in the, in the early nineteen nineties. Uh, then I kind of put that to a side. Um, and did a bunch of other projects and got my PhD and, and I thought, no, I've got some stuff here. And then one of my colleagues at the University of Calgary had some really good files around um, the, the sale to Argentina and South Korea. And I thought, no, I've got some additional material. Let's finish this, put it to bed. Uh, and then when I finished that book, it was like, I have nothing more to say. I've, I've done you know, this, this job. And I can vividly remember sitting in the car with my wife in Calgary and a news program comes in about this Calgary entrepreneur looking to build a nuclear power plant in Alberta. Um, and, uh, she looks at me, goes, did you know about this? I go, no. And she goes, well, how many nuclear experts are there in Alberta? And I made some quip about, you mean outside of this car? And I realized that there was something else here. So it actually started with that. And there was so much optimism when I started the project and what we were seeing, we were seeing the beginning of the, the first can-do refurbishment in New Brunswick. There was plans for a new build in Ontario, Saskatchewan, New Brad Wall comes to power and he's um, incredibly pro-nuclear and, and creates this uranium development partnership. You got Hennessy um, who was not a nuclear guy, was just a basic entrepreneur, which we have lots of in, in this province looking at it. But by the time I finished the book, uh, a lot of that optimism was was gone. Um, and uh, so it, it was a capsule in, in time. I, I, I think some stuff did occur, uh, but not nearly what was expected at, at the time. Fast forward to today, there is a lot more going on and, and not just talking, but actual multi-billion dollar projects, you know, and just this week, 
you know, the announcement that Pickering B is going to be refurbished, uh, in addition to Darlington and in addition to the, uh, the SMR fleet in Darlington. And, and so there's, there's so much more activity going on now than there was, um, 10, 15 years ago, despite that optimism, which is why I think people are a bit, uh, a bit gun shy to use that word re- revival or Renaissance today. Right. Right. No, I mean, I, I think it's very, very important. I've learned over the years uh, in clinical practice and, and outside as well to be super aware of what your biases are. Um, the lenses through which you see the world, how they're distorted. We all have them. And, uh, you know, I hate to say it, but I tend to be a bit of a pessimist. So thank you for brightening my perception of where we are at the current moment with your, your perspective from, from back in the day. Um, you know, it is, it is a fascinating element of the story that, uh, you know, we have this, uh, reactor design that, uh, I mean, we dreamed up, um, you know, and that came out of, you know, I I think a lot of, you know, nuclear advocates and industry folks probably don't like to talk too much about what the kind of original nuclear research that was going on up here was, uh, whether it was the Manhattan Project North or not. Um, But certainly, you know, that it was it was the war, we didn't want Hitler to get the bomb first. And there was a massive uh, investment uh, in North America, um, in in trying to get there first. Um, So could you tell me a little bit about uh, just sweeping way back in time? um, And I think you cover this in the exports book. But uh, yeah, about some of that it's, history, it's but... an absolutely fascinating story of how Canada ended up on the ground floor of, of the nuclear sector. And you know, we had the first or sorry, the 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 first country outside of the U.S. to have a functioning reactor uh, to have nuclear fission. And a lot of it was because of the threat to Britain. And so the British scientists came to Canada because we were still much more closely aligned with Britain in the, in the 1940s um, than we are, for example, today. And so we had this influx of British scientists combined with um, European refugees um, from Germany, from France, uh, who joined that team, came here. So it was considered a safe place to work. And they set up a lab in Montreal, plus our uranium deposits. And at that time, it wasn't about northern Saskatchewan. It was northern Ontario. It was Elliott Lake. And so they they created this lab. It was in partnership with the Americans. So the Americans had a couple labs. We had the one in Montreal. And we're all working together on a weapon system, you know, to get it first before the, the Germans did. But even during that time, all the participants, and, and the British included, were all thinking, what happens next? They all saw that this had huge civilian uh, capabilities. And where the can-do comes about is General Groves, Leslie Groves. And if you remember the old movie, uh, Paul Newman plays him, uh, Fat Man and Little Boy. Um, Groves is, the, is the, the military person, absolutely paranoid about secrecy, and he unilaterally ends all cooperation with the Canadians and the the British in the middle of the Manhattan Project for about a year, uh, maybe a bit less than a year. And it wasn't until the Atlantic Summit and, and Churchill and Roosevelt and King all agree on this. And then that brings everybody back together again. But what happened in that time period is the Canadians started doing independent work from the project. And that's the origins of the heavy water reactor system uh, that would become the can-do, was in that small window where you had all of these scientists, you have ended the cooperation with the Americans, but they don't put their tools down and they don't put their pencils down and that they continue working and create this. And there's an irony here that Groves was concerned about creating not just secrets leaving, um, uh, they were, even though the Soviets were an ally, they were very suspicious of, of the Soviets, but they created a competitor, a civilian competitor because of his actions, um, which I don't think he, he recognized at the time. So it is, it is a fascinating story. Um, and the other aspect of this, which I touch on is there was no debate either in Canada or in Britain to pursue the bomb. In Britain, it was just assumed that they were going to get their own bomb because that's what great powers 
did. In Canada, it was just assumed we were not going to pursue the bomb because we were not a great power, and therefore we put all of our energy into the civilian process. The British screwed up their civilian process uh, because I think they put so much energy. They had the gas-fired uh, uh, cooling uh, system, that the Magnox reactors just did not work very well. Uh, and I think it's because there was a disconnect between the military wing and the civilian wing. Canada, we didn't have that. But people have tried to go through the archives to see where the cabinet made this decision, where this debate occurred. There was no debate. We just naturally assumed we weren't going to do that. And we our focus was on civilian energy. All right. I mean, this heavy water story is, is fascinating. We have covered it quite a while ago with uh, Jeremy Whitlock, um, who's a great guy over at the IAEA involved in anti proliferation Yeah, Jer- Jeremy's great. Yeah, he's he's sharp. And so, I mean, the story of the heavy water war, um, you know, this, this plant in Norway, um, I think it was a hydroelectric facility that they were making heavy water at. I'm not sure what the purposes were at that point, but certainly the German bomb program with Heisenberg was heavy water based. And and the way that the heavy water as as Norway was being invaded by the Germans was secreted out. Uh, I think first through France and decoy boats and ships and things like that, uh, getting it over to England. And is that where the heavy water that we used, uh, you know, in the Montreal lab and later at Chalk River came from? I, I believe some of it did come from that because um, you know heavy water does occur naturally, but in very very rare circumstances and it it needs to be uh, constructed. Um, And in fact, one of the reasons we pursued heavy water was to use natural uranium, that it didn't require the enrichment capacity uh, that the the Americans did, which again is also tied into the to the bomb program. And so it was a nice mixture. But yeah, the, the story of, of Norway and how they got the heavy water out of Norway, you know, with the Nazis one step behind them is uh, it's it's a thriller. And, and uh, there actually was a, a mini series on, on Netflix about that that was uh, quite entertaining. I, I totally agree. I totally agree. Um, and just before we kind of move on closer towards the present, I just think this origin story is fascinating. I mean, heavy water was used, I think, in the production of some of the potential bomb material that went into uh, Little Boy and Fat Man. Uh, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm off on that. Uh, but I think the Hanford reactors um, for plutonium production in the U.S. were also heavy water reactors. So, so there is this, you know, while Canada went the civilian route, um, and we know later on with the exports of some technology in collaboration with the U.S. to India, that led to a proliferation issue there. I'm just, I'm just wondering if uh, we could explore that a tiny bit more. Uh, so there is a lot of discussion about whether the can because of their design, um, are a greater proliferation risk than a light water reactor. I've looked at that. I'm not convinced of that. I, I think both of them have uh, potential flaws that can lead to proliferation. Both of them have safeguards that are inherent in the system. And it depends on where you're coming from. So if you're an anti-nuclear activist uh, and you're based in Canada, you get fixated on, you know, the, the refueling capability of, of heavy water, um, you know, the, the ability of, of natural uranium, uh, the, the, the mixture with plutonium, and you ignore the light water proliferation risk. Likewise, if you're an activist in the United States, you do the exact opposite. So I'm not convinced it's actually, and I've never believed that it's a technological issue. It is, in fact, a political issue around proliferation. And I make this clear to my students. Uh, and I, I, I give this line about, well, the first country to develop a nuclear weapon was a third world country. And they all kind of look at me and go, yeah, but wasn't that the United States? And I said, yes, it was. But if you look at the level of technology the Americans had in the 1940s and compare it to today, I've got more computing power in my phone you know, than the Americans did in, in the 1940s. So it's not a technological problem. It's a political problem. And, and so focusing on a reactor design, if you wanted to build bombs, it is so much easier and simpler just to go and build a bomb than try to divert spent fuel from a reactor and convert it into uh, weapons-grade 
uranium or weapons grade plutonium uh, for, for a bomb. They do that for political purposes, not for cost or technological purposes. They, they do it to, to mask what it is that they're doing. And, and quite frankly, we did see a lot of that in the 1950s and 60s with countries using civilians' um, energy as a, as a mass to get to um, uh, a weapon system. But they also discovered, as the Brazilians did and the Argentinians did, just how difficult and complicated it is. Yeah, I mean, there's there's the difficulty of actually making the device and then to be able to have the the threat of deploying it, you know, the nuclear triad, what submarines, missiles and aircraft delivery, and then the ability to, you know, respond back. If it, 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 it seems like that became too costly, as you said, for Brazilians, Argentinians, the Swedes, a whole number of countries had had weapons programs they abandoned and we're left with what I think seven nuclear nations, or I well, think- we've we've got we've got nine right now. Um, you know, we, we we've got the five big countries that that were part of the nuclear non-proliferation treaty: the the Americans, the Russians, the Chinese, the French, and the British. And then since then, you've got India, you've got Pakistan, um, you've got North Korea, and and you have Israel. Uh, Israel's never officially tested. Uh, but it's well acknowledged that they have the uh, they they have the bomb, and I mean North Korea has basically starved its people to produce a, a, a bomb. So it's it's not technologically sophisticated to do now. Um, it uh, you just have to have the political will to do it, and and the Iranians are working really hard at it, but they're facing um, sabotage and, and other domestic problems in that country as well. Right, right. So uh, getting back again to the pursuit of this uh, Kandu reactor design, I'm thinking, you know, in the US, the the first commercial nuclear power plant, I believe, shipping port, and that came out of a nuclear propulsion system with Rickover and sort of settled in on the PWR, and I guess later the, the boiling water reactor came along. Um, the Brits, was, were their first reactors, uh, Magnox gas reactors, and then the Soviets? Yes. I'm just trying to put this all together. Were they RBMKs or... It, it sounds like there was a, a number of designs that proliferated. And then there we, were a we, lot of different designs because it was right at the beginning and everybody was experimenting on the best way of, of doing things. Um, and, and especially with the countries that had a weapons program like, like the British and, um, and, and the Russians, you know, that's where they, they went about doing it. Uh, what is more fascinating, I, I think, is is the French and how they kind of combined American technology with, with German technology in addition to their own pursuit of, you know, uh, the force de frappe, the, the, their own independent nuclear uh, weapon system as, as well. Uh, and so what makes Canada unique amongst all of these countries in the 40s, 50s, even into the 60s, is we were only working on the civilian side. We were not working on, on the military side. And so there was no crossover there. In fact, our military process ends, you know, in, in 1945. And, uh, you know, not, not that we should feel sort of too noble about that, because I think as your book explains, uh, Canada did host U.S. nuclear weapons on Canadian missiles and also just full on U.S. nuclear weapons uh, delivery systems, uh, I believe, Newfoundland and elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, up until, you know, the, the late 70s, um, you know, we, we historians often talk about the, the great battle uh, that, that brought down the, uh, the Diefenbaker government in 1960. Uh, three over hosting American nuclear weapons on, on Canadian soil, uh, but in, and uh, but in fact it, it remained for years after that. Um, and I would even make the case now we're still protected by the American nuclear umbrella, even though there's no weapons on our soil, and which the Indians are quick to point out. You know the some of the hypocrisy that, that Canada has given to the Indians and the Pakistanis saying, yes, but you are also very well protected there. Right, right. That's interesting. Okay, this is going to be a slight tangent, and we, we can snuff it if we have to. But, um, you know, in terms, again, of talking about nuclear weapons and delivery systems, um, you know, Canada developed the Candu reactor. This is one of, you know, been rated one of our top 10 engineering achievements. Another one of those top 10, I believe, was the Avro Arrow. Uh, it was widely recognized as being the world's best fighter interceptor at a time in which we wanted to get up to like Mach 2, Mach 3 to, I think, you know, intercept those Russian bombers before they came over. 
is is that a true narrative that part of you know there's many reasons and hypotheses why the Avro era was scrapped, but one reason was because we we're thinking that the delivery systems are now ICBMs or intercontinental ballistic missiles rather than than uh, airplane delivery. Yeah, it was delivered. it was it was where that was moving, and it was going to missile systems away from fighter planes. It was also the issue of cost. There is so much mythology uh, around the Avro Arrow, and and there remain, um, you know. Um, people whose hobby it is, you know, <laughs> just to, to study the Avro Arrow, which the, the linkage between the Kandu and the Avro, I think is very important um, because when they shut down the Avro Arrow, and that may be very well justified based on cost and the changing nature of future warfare, it's where those scientists and engineers went. Many of them ended up in NASA. Many of them had to leave the country and, and work elsewhere because there was no work for them to do here. Why that is significant is that memory has been linked back to the can-do, that we, we don't want to repeat what we did with the can-do scientists and the can-do engineers and the can-do technology with what we did with the Avro Arrow. And so we often talk about mythologies, which are not true. They're not false. It's belief systems. And that belief system has been very powerful. And that uh, if, if you walked into a cabinet room and, and you know, we're, we're making the pitch for an further investment in the can-do and export support and R&D, all you had to do was bring up the, the memory of the Avro Arrow. Um, and so regardless of whether the Avro era decision was correct or not, and, and I tend to be on the, on the side of the historians that say, yes, it was the right call, um, that's not the way the public viewed it, and it's still not the way it's viewed today. Right, right. Well, we're going to get to that because, um, you know, your book uh, in the Ontario chapter does discuss um, the potential new build, um, or potential as it was when you wrote the book, um, New Large Nuclear at Darlington uh, in that period of sort of 2008 to 2013. So we're going to, we're going to touch on that and we're going to talk, touch on the sort of technology selection and arguments about whether we should have gone, uh, with a foreign reactor technology or, or stayed, uh, stayed Canadian. Uh, but before, before we get there, I want to set the table a little bit more. Um, when I gave that talk in Australia, um, uh, Dylan Moon, um, who, uh, who consults with me, um, pointed me towards some, some really interesting graphs of, the price of coal after the OPEC crisis, obviously price of oil went through the roof, but we were still, well, some countries were burning oil for electricity and there was a shift to coal and probably other reasons why coal got expensive. But it seems, you know, when I look at nuclear, I look, you know, I'm avidly pro-nuclear, but I think I'm not delusionally uh, pro-nuclear. It's a really hard technology. It requires the best of the best. Maybe it requires some people coming into the Avro program <laughs> to, to help get it launched. Um, but uh, but it's hard, you know, and it's easier to do other things. And you only do nuclear if there's really an imperative there. And usually it's an energy security uh, situation. And so France, obviously heavily dependent on oil for electricity production after OPEC went nuclear. And it was interesting seeing that story in Ontario. And you, you touched on it a bit more in terms of where we were getting the coal from uh, to, to fire that that uh, coal fleet we had and, and some of the pragmatics of why Ontario in particular went nuclear. Can you, can you expand there's, on that? There's so many comparisons to the decision of France to go nuclear, the decision of Japan to go nuclear, and the decision of Ontario to go nuclear. And it was all about energy security. Uh, security in, in the sense of supply um, and as well as security of price and the volatility of price. So France and Japan really ramped up post OPEC. Um, and uh, France relied on the uranium deposits of its former French colonies in West Africa. Japan has nothing. They, they don't have gas. They don't have oil. They don't have coal. They don't have uranium. But they figured that because of the there's less volatility with the uranium price as it relates to nuclear energy than it is with ga uh, with a gas plant. And that's why Japan went there. Ontario made almost the same rationale and decision, but it was about coal. Um, we Ontario had already tapped out much of its hydro, even though they kept calling it Ontario Hydro. The, the, there, there wasn't much more hydro after they tapped Niagara Falls and some other areas. So they were relying heavily on coal, but there's no coal in Ontario. So the coal was either coming from Western Canada or it was coming from, um, you know, Cape Breton 
or who's coming from the United States. Well, to get it across, um, you're dealing with the Great Lakes. And, you know, it was a hell of a lot colder back in the 1950s, and the Great Lakes would often freeze over, and it was tough getting access there. And the Americans, the coal mining union was so powerful in West Virginia and Kentucky, there would be frequent strikes. So there were shortages of getting coal uh, to um, uh, to Ontario. And Ontario had this burgeoning manufacturing sector in steel and particularly automobiles. And to keep that electricity flowing, they needed a different source. That's why Ontario went nuclear. So you've got the, uh, the situation of the Montreal lab. So the infrastructure is starting in Montreal, but very quickly, everything moves over to uh, Ontario. And that's why to this day, Ontario is the heart and center of the nuclear industry in Canada because of the decisions that both the Ontario government and the Canadian government made at the same time to develop uh, nuclear in the province of Ontario because of the issues with coal. I mean, there's there's parallels there. I've I've spoken with some experts uh, about China's rationale for nuclear uh, they have a lot of coal, but it's in the wrong place in the country. It's off in the northwest, and their population centers are uh, on the coast of the southeast. And I think it was something like 50% of all rail traffic was just moving that coal around. Um, so a huge, huge expense there. So that, that's interesting context. You know, we had this coal phase out much publicized between 2005 and 2014. Um, it's been called North America's Greatest Greenhouse Gas Reduction. Uh, you know, we had massive problems with air pollution, certainly partially from the automobile sector, but the coal didn't help. Ontario Medical Association said 1,900 premature deaths uh, per year as a result of that air pollution, which coal contributed to. And it, it's much celebrated, but a lot of people scratch their heads and they go, well, hold on, you didn't build any new nuclear reactors during that time. But, you know, for me, looking at back into the history, I say, well, the coal phase that began in uh, 19, I'm trying to think when uh, Douglas Point came online, but probably we should probably talk more Pickering. Pickering was built instead of a coal plant. Can you talk a little bit uh, about that, about, you know, again, so, this idea yes, of the coal phase-out? So, yes, there was a coal phase-out, but they fixate on the final ending of the plants. Ontario had actually been phasing out coal uh, probably since the, the late 60s and definitely the early 70s when, when Pickering A came online because you didn't need as much coal. Um, and so the percentage of coal was dropping. It was only in the McGinty years that they finally got rid of the last plants. And so the, the, the final coal phase out, which people get fixated on, they often say it was due to renewables. It was due to, to the rise of wind because there was an increase in wind going on at that time. But no, it was the restarting of the reactors that had been temporarily shut down by the Harris government in, in 1997. It was the restarting of those nuclear power plants that allowed the McGinty government to do so. And when you listen to Jerry Butts, people often say, well, well, Butts was principal secretary to Trudeau, which he was, but he was also very highly involved in the McGinty government. Butts is quite honest. He says it was nuclear energy that allowed us to do the coal phase out. So the coal phase out went on for multiple decades uh, and it was all due to nuclear energy. It was not about wind. It was not about solar. It was not about gas plants. It was nuclear energy, both the building of Pickering and then the restarting of Pickering and Bruce in the early 2000s. Do you know any of the details around that that actual deal? As I understand it, um, when Ontario Hydro built Pickering, some of the budgeting and costing had to do with being price competitive to coal. Do you know any of those details? Or Don't know about those, um, but I think they were less focused on the um, whether they had to subsidize the nuclear power plant because this was about subsidizing electricity to the auto sector right and and you know i think there's a reason that pickering was built in pickering when you've got the, right. the massive gm plant in in oshawa right and so i don't know about the linkages with cost with coal because it wasn't just the cost of coal it was the reliability of getting coal supplies by train by boat dealing with american strikes what have you. So this, this was very fascinating for me, but obviously there's been this sort of yo-yo and dance. Um, you know, we had a lot of nuclear online and something went sort of terribly wrong in the nineties. 
Um, you know, you mentioned the the shutdown of of uh, Bruce A. and I guess Pickering A. Um, tell me a little bit more about about that period because right now, you know, the nuclear sector has a lot to celebrate. Amazing operations. You know, we've been celebrating the Pickering refurbishment. They got the World Association of Nuclear Operators you know, A plus or level one. So they're, they're doing a fantastic job running that plant, but things looked grim in the nineties. Tell me why. And tell me the oh, details. There was, there was an absolutely scathing report that came out, um, looking at some of the issues about the Bruce and Pickering facilities in, in the late 1990s to the Harris government. And it was sort of ad hoc modifications to designs that had been occurring over multiple years. There were workplace issues, uh, literally people, you know, showing up operators um, intoxicated and, and drug issues and every possible thing that you could have happen, which was affecting the performance and, and the concern about potential safety. And so they, they quickly shut down a third of the fleet. Uh, the the oldest of the reactors, uh, and it was it was a really gutsy call uh, by by the Harris government to to make, uh, but I don't think they had much choice given public pressure that was facing them when these reports uh, came out, and they commissioned additional uh, non Canadian nuclear experts to come in uh, to talk about these things, but they didn't dismantle them. And they didn't decommission them. And they, uh, then they made the decision that they were going to restart these um, with additional work and, and, and these sorts of things. But the other thing that they created was Bruce Power. This was a really important decision because it created competition within the nuclear sector. Uh, so even though Bruce remained a... Um, the, the, the reactors were owned by the Ontario government. By bringing in a private sector operator, uh, it forced competition with what would become OPG um, because they, they gave a contract to Bruce and said, if you can, you know, fire these things up and they're all safe and ready to go, you know, there's a potential profit for you to, to make. And so I think by creating this competition within a government owned system, which is very hard to do. Um, I think that really worked out and Bruce has become a great success story as, as a result of that. Can, can you explore again a little bit why, um, or if, if you're aware, what, like, why did the safety culture go to shit? Um, why did things get so grim? Cause that, that's, that's massive. I mean, I, yeah, I, like after Fukushima, like they shut down everything and that, this was came at a major cost in terms of the energy. People like fetishize energy conservation, but there's evidence that thousands of elderly Japanese died in heat waves because they were just not enough electricity to go around. Um, you know, and, and the cost to Japan of importing fossil fuels to replace that nuclear fleet, I think it was it's tens or even 100 billion um, in terms of uh, I don't know if it was per year, but it's an enormous number. So there must have been an economic sacrifice to doing that, but it was felt necessary. So what what went so wrong? Was it underinvestment? Was it you know, just it's hard to know. And I think you would have to talk to some of the old timers that were there at the time to see how things had changed, because it's not like concerns around nuclear safety just emerged in Fukushima. I mean, we have Three Mile Island in 1979. We have Chernobyl in 1986. This is 1997. Right. We do know there is an awful lot of turmoil around Ontario Hydro and the nuclear facilities in the early 1990s under the Ray government. Ray, Ray comes in there. There is a recession, but they also come in with an anti-nuclear attitude, as, as unfortunately too many um, NDP people have. And so there was all this stopping and starting of Darlington. Um, they, they put some activists on the board of Ontario Hydro, whether that was a contributing factor or not, whether it was just lackadaisical safety culture, because we've been doing this for 25 years without a problem. Um, you know, it, it's like people making home renovations, you know, and modifications. Well, you start off small, but 25 years later, it starts to look very different than the design that you had. So I would speak to some of the old Ontario Hydro people if they're still around or around what happened. But there was clearly a cultural problem that had emerged. And while the unions and management 
seem to be on much better page right now. They're both celebrating the, the refurbishment of, of Pickering uh, B. That was not the case in the 1990s, and there was a lot more hostility uh, between management and, and the unions. That may have also been a contributing factor. Right, right. Interesting. I mean, certainly uh, nuclear is a, a high-risk sector. I always make the comparison to aviation. Um, and Boeing really seems to have been going to shit in the last little while. Um, sounds like for organizational reasons in terms of, uh, you know, change in management and different approach. So certainly these industries are, are vulnerable to. Uh, well, avi- just- aviation is a good comparison because people don't count how many times a plane takes off and lands. You count when it doesn't land. And it's the same thing. You can have a, a power plant. That's why we talk about, you know, Chernobyl, Three Mile Island. Fukushima. The fact that we can remember them shows how rare a nuclear accident actually is compared to, let's say, a coal mine or a pipeline. But when it, when it happens, it's big, just similar to aviation. So that's a, a very accurate comparison. Let's, let's shift gears a little bit to talk about exports. We're going to talk uh, later about, again, technology selection, uh, the Darlington B. Um, that aborted process. Um, but something that uh, the Candor Reactor gave us was the IP um, and the ability to, to export. Um, you know, there's been the French, you know, imported uh, Westinghouse reactors and indigenized them and got the IP. As recently as uh, the early 2000s, the Chinese negotiated with Westinghouse and got the IP for the AP1000. And now they're, you know, creating the CAP, um, uh, the CAP uh, 1000 and 1400, which are essentially derivatives of, of that. Um, I don't think Canada would have been in a position, a big enough country, a strong enough sector to bargain with the Americans and say, hey, give us the IP. Um, anyway, we had the IP. What did we do with it in terms of, uh, of exports? It's an unlikely story that we were competing with the big boys. Oh, a- absolutely. And that's where my interest in nuclear energy came from, was as part of Canadian foreign policy. And, and that's why the, the first book is about our exports and, and how we did about it. Um, and it was recognized early on just how tough a fight Canada was going to be in. Because if you look at who the other nuclear exporting companies or countries were, it was the biggest countries in the, in the world. And so, yeah, we're a G7 country, but we were the seventh <laughs> of the G7 <laughs> countries. We're going head to head with the, with the Americans and, and the, um, and the Russians in the early years. And then, you know, the, the, the French and the Japanese start to come on side. So there be also because of the nature, uh, both in cost, the types of technology and its, uh, military applications, the, the the, the Soviets weren't going to uh, import American technology. The Americans weren't going to import Soviet technology. The French weren't going to, you know, all of this stuff. There was huge, huge trade protectionism. And there is Canada with a crown corporation going up against General Electric and Westinghouse, two of the largest companies in the world with the full backing of the United States. So it was very difficult for Canada to uh, to penetrate. The fact that we did as much to the Indians, to the Pakistanis, to the South Koreans, to the Romanians, to the Argentines, to um, to the Chinese, I think is a testament to the technology that we had. There was an acknowledgement, maybe not today, but definitely in the 60s and 70s, that the Candu was a real quality powerful reactor, quite possibly better than the uh, light water reactors that, that GE and Westinghouse were, were delivering. But the extra political baggage that went with them hindered our ability to, uh, to, to sell. And it's similar to the old beta versus VCR battles you know, back in the day. Uh, initially, beta was uh, considered the much better technology VCRs took over the market, and that was it for for beta, and that's why we often talk about beta, <laughs> beta max today. And so it it was those political uh, concerns, and so the fact that we achieved as much as we did, that still has an impact today. So there is now an investment. Romania is now building an extra two can dos. Uh, we still have the intellectual property. We've done refurbishments. Um, you know, in, in Argentina um, and the South Koreans, 
we sold numerous reactors to the South Koreans, and the South Koreans are now their own exporters. So we kind of uh, lost that. So, you know, I, I've been trying to understand our, our current situation um, and, you know, the political landscape. Um, you know, the, the Conservative Party is pretty regionalized. I mean, rural Canada across the country, but, you know, it's, it's certainly, you know, it's a Western party. Um, and I think they tend to represent areas that are natural resource rich, um, thinking of, you know, oil and gas, uh, mining, et cetera. Um, and then you have kind of central Canada, you know, not that we're uh, laggards in terms of natural resource development in Ontario, Quebec, but, you know, these are real manufacturing hubs. Um, and in terms of the kind of policies that are required to develop each of these sectors, uh, it strikes me that in more of a kind of oil and gas natural resource sector, if you can deregulate, maybe offer more competitive royalties, private business will come in and, and sort of take care of themselves and exploit your resource. And, you know, hopefully you get a nice chunk of it to do things for the country. But in, in the high tech sector, um, particularly as a small nation, um, it, it, you know, conservative politics, particularly sort of maybe I don't want to say neoconservative, but, you know, the, the more recent conservative politics are very sort of free market fundamentalist, um, very averse to what I've heard described as mercantilism um, of, you know, supporting a, a national player. But it, it seems like that's what's required. And, and I'm guessing that's what was required in terms of these exports uh, across the world. Uh, this, absolutely. You know. And and we had a lot more crown corporations, you know, back in the, in the fifties and sixties, it was really, it started under Mulroney where we started to privatize, um, uh, the, uh, the, the crowns. Uh, but prior to then it was because we were a small country trying to compete with others and it was access to capital and, and a feeling that private industry in a country this small, despite being rich, but, we didn't see ourselves compare, uh, competing against New Zealand or Sweden or Ireland. We were competing against the United States. And that, I think, required a, a crown corporation. That didn't mean that there weren't private businesses that support it. There's a huge private nuclear uh, component area in, in Ontario. But the design area um, was... Uh, what was a crown corp, just as we saw in many other sectors, whether that was rail, whether that was uh, aerospace. And you make the comparison with, with Bombardier, you know, a private firm, but had to rely heavily on government subsidies. And I would, uh, I, I don't have the actual figures, but I often joke, it's got to be the most subsidized private company in Canadian history. Um, and uh, that's kind of where we were. So, the, the conservative government's relationship with nuclear is, is really interesting because you look at where nuclear is. St. John, New Brunswick, Durham region, Bruce County, Chalk River, Ontario, they've always been represented by conservative MPs. Um, but the Harper government, I think, to be fair to the Harper government, when they were in office, every time nuclear hit the news, it was a bad news story. You know, whether that was the, the, the problems over isotope production uh, at Chalk River, whether that was, you know, the sticker shock of the, um, uh, of the new build costs in, in Ontario. They just wanted out. They just wanted out. And, uh, and so they sold off the reactor division of AECL uh, to SNC-Lavalin. Uh, um, even though it would be interesting if Mulroney hadn't spun off the isotope business from AECL, you know, back in the late 80s, early 90s, if AECL would have been a more profitable company after that. They seem to take, you know, the, the stuff that could make money and pull it away uh, and then complain why the existing companies still needed, uh, still needed investment. And th that whole arrangement remains quite quite complicated because it appeared that when, when SNC Lavalin initially got the contracts uh, and got the IP at a very, very low cost um, that they simply saw it as a reactor repair company, you know, and, and that their business was going to be refurbishment, not advancing the can do design and, and doing a new build. I think they believed that new builds were gone and that they were just going to be in this business for 30 or 40 years to keep some of them running. No, I mean, that's, that's certainly interesting. Uh, you know, I've, I've had analysts on who tell me, 
you know, listen, a lot of uh, reactor builds are loss leaders, but what you lock in are long-term fuel and maintenance contracts, which ultimately are, are the basis of the business. And with the ways that we've seen new builds spiral out of control in the West, particularly in the 21st century, um, it's not surprising that a company might just want to get that low risk, high return, steady income. And the can do offers that with, uh, with our regular refurbishments. You go ahead and respond to that, but there's so many strings and, and in that. You see that in Ontario right now. I mean, you look at the, the Ford government and it's, uh, it's decisions around and actually began under Wynn and McGinty, but around refurbishment. Right. Instead of building new reactors, how about we take our existing reactors and just let them operate much longer? Uh, this isn't the case of, you know, a 10 year old car trying to get an extra five miles out of it or five years out of it. I would compare it to a home, you know, that might be 50 or 60 years of age, but it's still structurally sound. It just needs a new furnace. It just needs some new plumbing. Uh, and, and, we know that the front end costs of nuclear are at the beginning. So the longer you can keep the thing running, the, the more economic it, it is. And so I think that's uh, the, the win and, and uh, Ford government should be thankful that they already had these existing plants, that their decision was just about keeping them open. And even in Quebec now is reconsidering its for, for refurbishment of Gen T2. Absolutely. Yeah. There, there's so many threads to tug on here, and I'm going to try and artfully find a way to do that because uh, there's just so much of interest. But I think the most natural place to go to is is that selling off of um, the reactor division of ACL, and we need to explore that a little bit more. I understand um, there were a number of countries that were interested. There was even potential interest and in, I think, paranoia from some of the uh, nuclear industry and the unions in particular that a competitor nation like Arriva might buy it just to kill it. To get rid of a competitor, that's interesting. That, that yeah. Canada could even be a competitor in that regard against. Oh, such a big Arriva country. was very. They were they were lurking. <laughs> yeah. There is no doubt about that. Arriva wanted access to that, um, and I think the, uh, the the Harper government realized if they were going to privatize this, they had to privatize it Canadian, uh, because I think there would have been a, a public backlash. Um, as well as a scientific backlash had they, uh, had they gone to a, uh, a foreign competitor. But that were, I think that was a real threat at the time that this might be taken over by, by Arriva in particular. So who were the bidders eventually and uh, what were the bids and who won? And, you know, I mean, that's, this, this, been... this is an, it's an extraordinary story. Like I think cumulatively in the history of uh, Canada's nuclear sector, I don't know how you do the economic calculations, but we're talking tens or maybe even a hundred billion dollars invested over the length of our nuclear program to develop this reactor technology. So you'd think it would sell for a pretty penny. And it wasn't, it was about $15 million to SNC Lavalin. And, you know, SNC Lavalin was a nuclear company had been involved for, for decades, large, powerful company. Um, they've, gone into disrepute over the last couple of years on, on, on numerous uh, scandals, but they were, they were a likely target. Um, the, the other would have been a consortium of, of non SNC, but it, it's how they changed it because you've got this company that does R and D that does reactor designs that has liabilities that has assets, but they hived off the reactor division company and left the lab. And so even though the lab is um, what we call a GoPro, it's, it's government. You're talking ACL here. You're talking, ACL, you're talking about ACL, yeah. not, not SNC it right now. You're talking ACL. Okay. Two yeah. divisions. Yeah. yeah so, Chalk River and yeah. Yeah. So what they did is they hived off the reactor division, sold that off, privatized that, but they kept the R and D and the labs and, 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 even though it's now privately operated, it's still government owned. And some of that is that is, is legacy. So we often talk about, um, you know, nuclear waste as, as spent fuel. The Chalk River site has some areas you don't really want to go around and no one's going to take those assets over. Or, um, and, and so that's why the government had to stay involved. Plus, there were concerns that the private companies were not going to do the R&D that was required. And so uh, they, they got that off their, their plate. But in, in looking back now, 10 years later, maybe 15 years later, 
what the Harper government was able to do is get rid of all these bad problems. And, and the bad problems that all existed in the early 2010s uh, around the privatization, around the refurb in, in Point Le Pro, around the isotopes, uh, around the NRU reactor, those stories are all gone now. And I think that then led the, 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 the Band-Aid was peeled off. The scab was gone. Now the scab is healed, and it's allowed the nuclear industry to do the multi-billion dollar refurbishments and the exploration, the serious exploration of SMRs. So it's so, it's been a transformation. Of so the here's industry. the cra- here's the about that. Here's the crazy thing in the context of us now having um, a potential n- new large build happening at Bruce. I understand Bruce Power was the other entity that was interested in buying uh, the reactor division of Candu. Obviously, we wouldn't have a technology selection if Bruce had bought uh, Candu. Uh, but just tell me, why did that fall through? Because they were going to pony up a lot more money than SNC, I believe. Yeah, and I don't know why what what happened with Bruce. I, I don't know. Um, again, because these are uh, commercial agreements, uh, there is a lot. So they would lay out options. You know, the publicly available documents laid out options, but they never talked about the different bids that they received. Those have all been uh, been, been sealed. And so I don't know um, what pulled Bruce out. I know at that time, um, TransCanada, which was one of the investors in Bruce, uh, left uh, and they pulled out their investment. Whether that was all linked um, to to those bad times, I don't know. But that would have been a very interesting decision had they gone Bruce instead of SNC, especially given what has happened to SNC since that sale. So we we did this beautiful. We've, we've been making a lot of uh, connections between nuclear and aviation with the Avro Aero with the safety culture. Uh, but I'd like to make one more. Um, and that is with the C-Series uh, Bombardier jet, which I understand um, is a far superior model to what Airbus and Boeing had on hand in terms of fuel efficiency for a, I believe, a mid-sized passenger jet. Um, and ultimately, um, I think for very similar reasons, um, you know, this is probably a, a true Canadian story in terms of over and over again, we see this happening, uh, was sold off for a song uh, to Airbus. I'm not sure how familiar you are with that story, but do you think that's a, a good analogy to what happened to Candu? I, I know they were sold off not to a national player, but are, do you see any similarities or lessons learned there? Oh, uh, absolutely. And and I would say less uh, about the selling off of uh, the Candu reactor division as opposed to the spinning off of the isotope business that had occurred a decade prior um, that has gone on to do very well. Um, right. And uh, had that remained as part of AECL, who knows how life would have uh, turned out. I, I guess you're, getting... you're not selling off Bombardia, you're selling off one possible profitable right. aspect of it. And that's where I would make that, that comparison. But I guess the comparison I'm trying to make is you have this an excellent, amazing technology, superior jet. Um, but maybe your country is too small in terms of like this maybe would be analogous to the, the export issue and Canada's struggle to export can yep. an ultimate success to do it. But I guess there wasn't the gumption there. And the idea that um, Bombardier could compete with the big boys um, was, uh, you know, would have enough endurance to be able to give buyers uh, the certainty that they'd be around to do maintenance, et cetera. Um, so ultimately, they were bought off by a, by a larger company. I, I'm interested in that sort of export side of it. Again, I'm not sure if you have that. Yeah, kind of expertise and, and, to comment, and I would but. I would agree with that. In fact, I would say it was even tougher from Bombardier. There's a fascinating case study of the battles that they were having with Embraer, uh, the Brazilian uh, company, uh, and there was a World Trade Organization decision um, involving Air Wisconsin of all places, uh, and both. Uh, companies were trying to sell to Air Wisconsin these mid-sized jets, and uh, both of them were heavily subsidizing one another. So, um, again, we weren't just dealing with um, Airbus and Boeing. Now we're dealing with Embraer because we're now seeing the rise of Brazil, you know, which has 250 million people versus our 40. So, yeah, similar, similar challenges. It's not always the technology. It's all the extra weight that you can put around those export opportunities, the salesmanship and the marketing and et cetera. Yeah. 
I can ask you a leading question here, <laughs> but it will, it'll be interesting only because you're going to probably flesh it out a bit. But um, with with the uh, in the context of you know advanced engineering, high technology, um, you know coming out of a variety of different types of countries, different sizes, is there such thing as a free market there when they're competing with one another, or do governments always end up backing? Because I, I, I get this, impre- I, I get this impression that that there's an element within. Um, you know, the Canadian, uh, I'm not talking about the political spectrum that this is partisan, but just there's a political tradition. Maybe it's a relatively new one that says we shouldn't, we shouldn't back national champions, uh, because you know, the market should decide and whatever best will happen. And that'll provide best value to consumers down the road. Um, that certainly I think conflicts with, you know, um, some more traditional conservative values, but I'm just, I'm just trying to sort that out and understand it better. Uh, outside of elaborate econometric models that economists do, the free market doesn't exist. Um, We've got all sorts of government regulations that are put in place. You look at foreign investment, and yes, we're attracting foreign investment, but there's usually conditions and strings attached to that. You're looking at corporate dollars going into private business. Look at um, the EV battery plants in in Windsor. Um, So the free market does not exist. There's different degrees of government intervention and different types of government intervention. And uh, all countries have that. Uh, There's no ideal type pure socialist system anymore. And there's no ideal type capitalist system. It's all various forms of of government intervention, whether that's through antitrust, whether through that's through tax and, and subsidies, whether that's through regulation, whether that's investment rules. Okay. I guess we'll, we'll finish on the export topic and then we're going to jump into this technology selection issue. Um, one of the interesting parts from uh, the uh, politics of Kandu exports was how close Canada came to uh, selling Kandu to Japan. Um, that would have been consequential yeah. for a variety of reasons, obviously for economic reasons. Fukushima probably wouldn't have happened because Kandus can cool themselves for about seven days uh, with thermal siphoning through the flooded steam generators. Uh, we'll leave that question of the accident aside, but what, what went on there? We had these amazing successful bids uh, in China, uh, South Korea, Argentina, yeah, et cetera. Why not? It, we why not came Japan? very just the role that the GE and the American government had in Japan. And you also have to look at that time period. This is the 1970s. This is post OPEC. And we this is when we start to see the massive amounts of Japanese auto exports going into the United States. Uh, because now they're because of their small country and because gasoline was so expensive, they developed fuel efficient vehicles. So they were able to have these fuel efficient vehicles that the big three um, were too late to come to the table with. And so you've got that going on. Now you've got a desire of major American firms trying to sell nuclear energy to Japan. You also have a massive American military presence in Japan. And you've got pressure coming from the Reagan administration um, over, over these auto things this seemed, there was no way Canada was going to win. Uh, Canada came close. Canada had a good bid. Canada had a good reactor. Uh, and you think, well, what does autos have to do with nuclear energy? A lot. It's, uh, um, I, it would have been tough to imagine how Canada would have won in that fight. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's pivot in the time we have left um, to talk about this question of technology selection. Um, when I read your book, there were so many echoes uh, from what's going on now back to uh, that bidding process uh, at at Darlington B for um, the license capacity there, which which still exists, but is now being uh, used for SMRs. So help me paint the picture of, of what was going on there. And I want to explore a little bit of how that unfolded and the, the politics of how that unfolded, et cetera. So prior to that time in Ontario, there had never been a bidding process. You were going to build a reactor. You were going to build a can-do. It was, it was that simple. Um, but Ontario decided um, that they wanted a competitive bid process. Um, and so then you've got Arriva coming in. You've got Westinghouse coming in. Both of those were being aided and abetted through export financing from their governments. 
But because ACL was in Canada, they were not eligible for any export financing. Had they had ACL been trying to go to Argentina, they would have been eligible for export financing. So you have a situation where Ontario is creating for its own provincial political purposes, a, a bidding contest because they're looking for a competitive price. But the Canadian company, the Canadian champion is running at an unlevel playing field to the foreign competitors. And there was, and so you get this fight going on between the Ontario government, which owns, which would have owned the reactors, and the federal government, which owned ACL. And we didn't see that when Pickering was built. We didn't see that when Darlington was built. There was close collaboration between the Ontario government and the Canadian government and ACL and Ontario Hydro, but not when 2010 came around. And uh, so we've got issues of federalism. We've got issues of, of competing needs and expectations. And you're dealing with foreign competitors who have greater assets to, to play because of the nature of the market that they were delivering into. And so. So there's, there's something for, there's something very unique about um, Canadian nuclear history and the Canada reactor. And we actually didn't touch upon this part. Um, but you know, when, when we're talking about energy security and price security, uh, there was also an element of uh, manufacturability um, and fueling security. So, you know, we went with pressure tubes. We couldn't make heavy forgings for the pressure vessel. We went with natural uranium because we didn't want to rely on others for uh, enriched uranium. Um, and the side effect of that is this hyper-localized supply chain. And I'm not sure if it's unique. I'm trying to think about the Russian or Chinese nuclear sectors. They're probably big enough that that they do have a, you know, 88 to 96% sort of in-country uh, supply chain. But Certainly within the West now, nuclear has become, you know, a, a multinational endeavor and supply chains span the world. And there's heavy forgings in Japan or in Korea, Doosan and uh, modules being made in Czechia, I think. Um, there's something special about the, the Canadian uh, reactor design being all Canadian, uh, economic benefits, GDP, uh, tax revenues. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and how that fit fit into the well, and, uh, and, the and assisting the the manufacturing sector as a whole? So you've got companies that may do nuclear business, but they can have spin off products that go into other commercial entities. Uh, this allows for export opportunities and and a whole variety of things. So, yeah, the whole supply supply chain link is is a really critical uh, importance because the days of any product, whether that's a car or an Apple Watch or a television, all being manufactured with all the IP and all the components from one country, those are long gone. And it is, really is a, a globalized market, which is both an opportunity uh, for Canadian firms as well as a threat for Canadian firms. And and some of, but some of the stuff, as you're correct, are just so specialized. Uh, that I feel that we're we we've, we've lost some of that capacity. Can you can you expand upon that? What what sort of capacity has been lost? Well, some of those heavy forages, you know, you you start to lose that capacity if you're not building, if right. if you're not rebuilding, right? And and we, so we know, the abs, we we didn't so have heavy long forging. Of time. Yeah, we, we uh, my understanding was we didn't have the heavy forging, so we we went with this pressure tube design because we could manufacture that locally. Yeah. yeah, I'm I'm moving a bit further away from my area, but obviously supply chain is is critical here. For sure, and for sure. it's and then, now become an international supply chain. Yeah, yeah. In terms of again the politics of how that played out, I understand that uh, ACL and maybe SNC at the later part of the the bidding process, uh, they were sort of forbidden from talking about that question of of local economic uh, development. Um. Was that was that something that was still a consideration? And and again, with with this current bid, we don't know who the owner of the reactors at Bruce will be. Uh, was it clear then that OPG would be the the owners, and we're doing the tech selection, or was the government of Ontario involved in the tech selection? How did that I mean work? at the at the end of the? I mean, because this was aimed at Darlington, that would have been OPG and the Ontario government. It's always been clear that the Ontario government will own things. Uh, what the agreement is with Bruce is as an operator. So my guess is. Um, 
Bruce will operate these reactors. They'll be owned by OPG, which is owned by the Ontario government. Then the question becomes, okay, if that's the arrangement, who makes the call on the technology, the owner or the operator? The, the idea, I guess, is that they would both come to an agreement. But what if they don't? You know, who has the final thumb? I, I don't know. I mean, these are, these are questions to um, discover, discuss, you know, in the same sort of, yeah. In your book, you talk a lot about the kind of anti-nuclear and pro-nuclear coalitions. I'm, I'm much more interested in the pro-nuclear ones for obvious reasons. But in terms of this question of, of that coalition that came together in Darlington and will likely come together around the Bruce bid, um, you know, in, in talking to some of my union friends, uh, when it comes to the SMR technology that's been selected at, at Darlington, it's an American-style uh, boiling water reactor, uh, enriched fuel, um, you know, they're really alarmed because they say, listen, um, you know, the crews that are going to come and, and swap out the fuel and manage the outages of a boiling water reactor will be specialized crews from the U.S. They manage, I'm not sure if it's 30 or 40 of those reactors, they just go around from reactor to reactor all year long and they're amazing at it. That's why U.S. has some of the highest capacity factors in the world. And so it wouldn't make any economic sense for Canadians to do that work. And so they're seeing a chunk of potential work disappearing. And, you know, if we if we have a American style reactor as a smaller one to fit with maybe Alberta, Saskatchewan and other provinces and an American style reactor uh, for our larger needs, one can imagine there there's going to be sacrifices of, again, large chunks of, of the existing Canadian supply chain, whether that's fueling, um, whether that's engineering services that support troubleshooting um, the candy reactor, how how did that play out um, during the 2009 bidding process? Yeah, so when we talk about these these coalitions, uh, the, what unites the pro coalition is a whole series of belief systems around the importance of nuclear energy and and the value that that brings. But then you see bre uh, breaks within the coalition when it comes down to commercial interests. So, you know, you can have three different companies all agree the importance of nuclear, all working together to get nuclear. Now they're competing for a design, and then that starts to break things, uh, break things down. And the SMR decision was, I think, so critical because they were first. And the only way SMR uh, makes monetary sense is to build a fleet, not to have a series of one-offs. So when Ontario made the decision to go to GE Attache, well, guess what? Now Saskatchewan is going GE Attache. And uh, Alberta hasn't made a design, but the relationship between OPG and Capital Power, and OPG has already made the decision around GE Attache, you can see where this is going, at least on the SMRs. Well, now we've got a traditional reactor project going on in Bruce. Do you go with a different design, a uh, an updated can-do design for the traditional and a different design for the SMRs, right? These are some of the questions that I think are going to be uh, posed. I don't think we can have any answers now, but that's where the questions are going to be. Just as it didn't make sense in Canada in the, in the 60s to have more than one reactor design, I don't think it makes sense at an SMR level to have more than one reactor design, but can you have different designs for a 700,000 megawatt reactor versus a 250, 300 megawatt reactor? Those are some really interesting economic, technological, manufacturing, political types of questions. And you're not going to get unanimity on that. <laughs> I'm going to have to quote Britney Spears here and say, oops, I did it again. Um, I've pulled you from Alberta, and we focused almost exclusively on Ontario. Um, so I apologize to my Western Canadian. No, no, um, that's fine. I mean, that's the audience. heart of the industry. But, but I think I think you know we don't have time to sort of go through each province as your book did. And I'd encourage listeners to buy the book um, and invest in some duct tape to uh, fix the binding. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, I think there are some interesting themes. You, you covered Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, New Brunswick. Obviously, Quebec has a nuclear program. But I think what's really interesting is, you know, we've got these hydropowers, whether it's Manitoba, Quebec, and BC. I mean, what I used to say were inexhaustible hydroelectric uh, potential. And so why would they ever go nuclear? But, you know, as you mentioned with Quebec, they're talking about potentially bringing that mothballed can do back online. 
Uh, there's some whisperings in BC uh, and they're trying to investigate, you know, these, these very um, ambitious climate goals that are going to require significant growth in their grid. And they're struggling with drought. We, we don't usually, you know, are very quick to understand that wind and solar are intermittent and weather dependent, but hydro is, I guess, climate dependent. And we've seen some uh, major issues with droughts across the country this year that have, have affected output. So Maybe let's let's talk a bit about those hydroelectrically. Yeah, I mean provinces. there was a there was a major press conference yesterday in Alberta where they're saying we're at a stage four level of drought. Stage five is a uh, they they have to bring in a national emergency, so they're very worried about drought coming in the in in the summer. Uh, and so is the BC government, and so is the Manitoba government, and so is the Quebec government. Not about agriculture and water supply, but their electricity supply. Uh, because of hydro. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the uh, the Gen T2 refurbishment is back on the table. Uh, that's been a political football for a decade. Uh, it is clear that Hydro-Quebec wants to restart it. The Quebec government does not. But this may now be forcing their, their hand. And, and the B.C. government, the, the very fact that B.C. is even saying the word nuclear without spitting afterwards, I think tells you the concern that they're that they're having. So of those places, I think Quebec is much more likely because they have the existing facility. uh, And it would be similar to what they did with Bruce and Pickering A back in the day. Um, You know, they're saying, well, it's been 10 years. Yeah, well, it was about 10 years uh, that they restarted the Bruce reactor. So I think that's the the parallel uh, that that they have there. Uh, But really, I think you're back to Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, and New Brunswick. Uh, Ontario obviously has the most activity, but there is some serious stuff going on out in the prairies, much more serious than even uh, back in 2010. So, and and the, and the connection I'm making is uh, that that agreement, uh, feasibility study between OPG and Capital Power, that that's big. Because there, they're not talking about the oil sands. This isn't the Pathways Alliance. This is a large, privately owned uh, electricity generating company in Alberta thinking about putting it directly on the grid and linking themselves up with OPG, you know, who owns the reactor, has been operating the reactor. So that that's not just a couple guys in a room. These yeah. are big players. Absolutely. I guess in closing, um, you know, as we mentioned in terms of the early deployments in Ontario, Japan, France, et cetera, um, you know, these were driven uh, by the energy security imperative. Um, you know, there's certainly a lot of talk about doubling or tripling our grid due to, you know, climate driven goals of electrification. Um, I think those are all well and good. But again, uh, maybe it's the pessimist in me. Um, I think it's easy to talk and set goals and make commitments. Um, it's easy to build. Uh, you know, wind farms and solar farms, those are highly constructible, highly modular uh, projects, um, you know, and, and I guess with a, a lot of public support um, and a good narrative behind them. Nuclear is, again, it's, it's the hardest of hardwares. It's, it's, it's very tricky. It requires exceptional levels of institutional maturity, um, incredible human resources, and those are dwindling at times uh, demographically. Um, and so I'm, I'm wanted to get your, your, your thoughts because it seems like, um, the, that key driver of, of energy security is potentially not there. I mean, Alberta is awash in oil and gas, uh, Saskatchewan as well. Um, you know, BC, uh, I'm, I'm not so sure. Maybe they'll be more cr- climate driven. But I guess just in closing, um, the, 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 the climate talk uh, versus the energy security imperative, is there sufficient energy security imperative there to drive these provinces to do the, the incredibly technically difficult, financially difficult uh, thing of, of building nuclear? It's not just about energy security. It really is climate. Um, And it is the the recognition that they have to scale down emissions. And so the debate in Alberta, it's not about nuclear replacing the oil sands. It's about nuclear aiding and helping the oil sands drive down its emissions costs. Because those are long-term 20, 30, 50, 60 year debates, as opposed to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, you know, which 
hopefully will be over soon and the effects that that has on, on energy security. I still think it is the, the climate debate. Uh, that is not going away. Um, uh, investors, insurance companies, um, even if you get rid of the consumer carbon taxes, as, as Polyev is promising, there's still going to be work being done uh, at the industrial level. And so what has changed I think is not uh, is is the realization, at least here in Alberta, of the big energy companies that nuclear is not a competitor. It's an aid. It, it's a help. It's an assistance that they can work together. Um, and and I think that's that's something that has has changed. Do do you see? I mean, we're certainly seeing the farmers' protests in Europe. Um, we had the yellow vest some time ago. Um, you know, when it comes down to an affordability crisis, uh, you know, climate does take the back seat when, when people are surveyed and said, how much money would you put uh, per year into fighting climate change? It's like $100 or less. Um, I'm just, you know, in, in my pessimistic anticipation, perhaps of, of further economic hardship or recession, etc. Um, you know, Robert Bryce, and I think Roger Pilkey talk about this iron law of electricity that in the end, you'll use any fuel, you'll burn anything to get the electricity that you need. Obviously, it's lovely if it can be carbon free, and I'm I'm a climate hawk, uh, but again, I'm a little bit of a cynic. Um, like, are we seeing a rollback in ESG? Are we going to see a rise of you know governments in Europe that are more on the political right and are saying, hey, these these, these green and energy policies have been disastrous. We're deindustrializing, we're losing business, and a kind of whiplash and backlash against climate action. Do you think that's on the horizon, and do you think that would affect again uh, a climate I mean, imperative is, for it, nuclear? Uh, that is an effect. Um, but uh, in, in, in Europe, um, in the case of Canada, and I would also say in Europe, it's, it's what I would call the, the direct cost versus the indirect cost. And I often use the comparison of the GST. Uh, the GST caused a firestorm when it was introduced. Um, this is the goods and sales and, tax for my international Yeah, listeners. the goods and sales tax. Yeah. But it replaced a much worse indirect tax. Uh, but because it was now visible, Consumers realized it and rebelled. Same thing with the carbon tax. We'd had an industrial carbon tax in uh, Alberta um, since the Stelmac days in 2006, 2007. The Kenny government, which railed against the consumer carbon tax in this province, increased the industry carbon tax. So I think we need to separate the indirect to direct. So yeah, I think uh, the, the consumer tax is under great strain in Canada. Uh, clearly, Polyev's Axe the Tax message is, is resonating. You'll notice he doesn't talk about industry, right? He doesn't. <laughs> so that's, that's a separate thing. And it's because even if it's worse, if, if it's not in your face, it's the less of a concern to you. It's, it's those visible policies that you can see and touch that those lead to the backlashes. And you're dealing with the professionals, uh, the, the scientists, the engineers who really know this stuff, know what, what is coming as opposed to the mass public when, when you're talking about industry levels and regulation levels. So I'm a bit more optimistic on that side. I, I share your pessimism about the consumer carbon. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm more bullish that uh, we'll, we'll still see work on climate at the industry level. Interesting. Okay. Dr. Bratt, I could talk to you all afternoon, um, but uh, it's been a pleasure. And maybe that means we'll have to have you come back. It's been fascinating to get the uh, analysis of a, of a political scientist on a technical issue to be able to chat about, um, you know, export and, and, uh, uh, you know, economic nationalism and all these other things. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to having you in my network to be able to bounce ideas off. So thank you for being so generous with your time. And uh, thank you for coming on. Decouple. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Chris.